Obscure horror media has always been one of my favorite things to delve into in my free time. Something about looking into and enjoying works of horror that not many choose to shed light on makes the whole experience feel special to me. The less known something is, the harder it is to have the experience spoiled for you and the more likely you are to get scared by it. I especially feel this way about horror games. I've played a lot of obscure horror games in my years of loving the genre, some being great and others just being unmemorable. But there was one which caught my attention recently that I would love to talk about, one which uses a small enclosed map to its advantage, and one which uses inventive chases and scenarios to stand out among the many others I've played. And that game is a little indie horror game called No One Lives Under the Lighthouse. I haven't read any of the reviews, I haven't looked at what Steam rated it, um, I haven't looked at any of the screenshots even, I've just seen the title screen and the description from the store page since Jason bought it for me. So this is going to be as blind as you can be going into a game. If you've never heard of this little indie game, I can't blame you, because neither did I. This game was given to me a few months back for my birthday by a good friend of mine, and while I had no idea what it was, I decided to hold off playing it until I could make a video on it. And thank goodness I did. No One Lives Under the Lighthouse is an extremely interesting horror game which uses its deceptively simple premise to create a unique experience full of jarring and sometimes horrifying moments. While playing this game, you never know what to expect, and that lack of knowledge creates a stressful and interesting atmosphere that sticks with you for quite a while after it's been finished. Today, I want to go over everything that makes this game an extremely memorable experience, and what makes it one of the most underrated horror games I've played in a while. So without further ado, let's delve into it. go into what makes this game so cool to me, I want to start this off by explaining what this game's even about. In No One Lives Under the Lighthouse, or as I'm just gonna call it from now on, Under the Lighthouse, you play as a lighthouse keeper brought to a small island in the middle of nowhere. Your job? Maintaining said lighthouse and making sure it's bright and shining for any sailors who may be passing by in the middle of the night. The game opens with us inside the lighthouse in the middle of the night, grabbing whatever supplies necessary to get it working, and climbing a spiraling staircase until we eventually reach the crank used to make the light spin. Once we take the time to turn the crank and get the lighthouse spinning, all that's left to do is use our oil canister to get the light shining. Upon doing this, we're shown a cutscene of the camera panning out far away from the lighthouse, until suddenly flickering out and cutting to current day, where we see a pair of people rowing towards the island, explaining how the old keeper went missing. That's right, the guy we play as at the start goes missing. From what? We have no clue. All that matters now is that we'll be taking his place, dealing with whatever horrors he did before his supposed death. And with this bleak and ominous opening, the game really begins. As soon as the ominous intro cutscene ends, we get to explore and get used to the environment around us. The island we find ourselves playing on throughout the game is a very small, lonely location. The sky is constantly grey and cloudy, the only company we have are the seagulls which fly away the closer we get to them, and our only real place to call home is a small wooden house smack down in the middle of the island. This location is great for setting the tone, because it gives the game this dreary feeling of loneliness throughout it. We really do feel like we've been abandoned here with only one task to do, and that's keep the lighthouse working every single night. And I think the game does a great job of both reminding us of this task, as well as making us dread it. With how small the island we play on is, there isn't too much to explore every single day before nightfall. We can walk from one end of the island to the other in less than a minute, and the only other buildings we have to interact with are an outhouse and a workshed. By having the environment so small, it makes it so the lighthouse is visible to us no matter where we go, reminding us of where we will eventually be heading as soon as we run out of other things to do. And I found myself dreading those moments where I had to go back there, because the introduction of the game conditioned me into believing that bad things would happen inside the lighthouse. And bad things certainly do. I clicked for a time. Ah, jeez, so why is that so loud? Huh. Alright, well. I've still got duties to do, right? 
Oh my god, wait, is there something down there? Yeah, moths. Oh, they're all moths. Oh my god! Each day you spend on the island, more disturbing events begin to unfold around you, each one being equally as unpredictable as the last. One minute you'll be finishing your duties for the night, turning on the lighthouse, and next thing you know the game shows you a cutscene of some nondescript monster waking up from underneath one of the boats at the dock, and it abruptly cuts to the next day. And the game does a lot of that, warning you of threats that are now present on the island with you, but never showing you where or what they are. It gives this building feeling of tension with every day you play, making you feel more and more like at any moment whatever it was the game warned you about is going to rear its ugly head around the corner. Doing your daily tasks like keeping the lighthouse clean and making sure it's turned on at night suddenly give these feelings of paranoia. Like at any minute while you sit alone turning the crank to turn on the lighthouse, something may come sprinting up the stairs after you while you can do nothing to stop it. This feeling of tension is even further pushed by the way the game chooses to limit your vision wherever you go. The old graphical style of the game makes it so the further something is from you, the more distorted and pixelated it becomes, making it hard to make out something that you're approaching until you've gotten uncomfortably close to it. Another way the game limits your vision is when entering rooms. Rather than just opening a door normally, the game deliberately chooses to have a black transition between where you currently are and where you're going. In my first playthrough, this seemingly simple design choice had me feeling really paranoid, as I had no idea if I was going to be greeted to an empty room or some kind of horrifying monster in my face every single time I would enter or leave a building. These two factors of limited visibility as well as the knowledge that something is on the island with you creates this tension that just continuously builds and builds and builds until finally the monster shows itself and you're greeted to some of my favorite chase sequences from any horror game I've ever played. I'll follow you outside. It's too open. You wouldn't bother. It's not spooky enough. Yeah, but like, I feel like the game's... Oh my god, oh my god, I actually am running from it. What the hell? Yeah. No, 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 inside. No, no. What the? Ah! The chase sequences in this game are some of the coolest I've ever seen from any indie horror game I've ever played. The way the game abruptly cuts to the POV of the monster chasing you while you're still in control of your character is a really unique and inventive idea that really surprised me the first time I played this game. But uniqueness and creativity aside, I genuinely just think these chases are very well designed. The way the game's limited visibility comes into play here is really, really cool, with you having the harder time seeing where your character's going the further the monster is getting from you. It makes it so that even when you're at an advantage in effectively getting away from the monster behind you, you're constantly worried that you'll end up running into something that you can't see or end up going in the wrong direction. These chases only ever come to an end when you find your way into one of the buildings around the island, and thanks to how suddenly they happen, as well as how hard it is to see, they end up being quite challenging and really scary. I also found that they happen just sparsely enough through the game's playtime that I never knew when a new one was coming, so each time it genuinely caught me off guard when I found myself suddenly thrown back into these terrifying scenarios. And speaking of terrifying scenarios, the chase sequences in this game aren't the only way it tries to scare you. One of my absolute favorite parts of this game are the random events that happen seemingly out of nowhere. This game presents its scares with a lot of subtlety most of the time, usually opting to let something strange and unexplainable happen that sticks with you. Some of my favorite examples are moments like when the lighthouse is swarmed with moths that begin to try and break in through the glass. This moment was awesome because it was slowly built up, at first just seeming like a couple of moths just there for decoration, which suddenly turned into a whole swarm. The moment makes you feel a sense of urgency, like there's something you have to do to escape before they come breaking in to kill you, but there's no way out. Just when you think they'll come through and get you, the light suddenly turns off and you're left alone again in complete silence. 
I think my other favorite moment that showcases how well the scares in this game are done comes in the form of a jump scare that happens in the lighthouse's cellar. We stumble in there looking for our lantern on a table, and upon finding it and trying to leave, the door appears to lock on its own, and the light of our lantern flickers out. As we turn around to try and look around again, there's suddenly a black figure standing behind us, and before we can even react, the game cuts to black. Moments like this one are what I mean when I talk about the game's subtlety. This jump scare is so effective because it happens in a scenario we've done several times over throughout the game, so we go into it with no expectations of something popping out at us. I find that this is terrifying coupled with the fact that there's no jump scare sound accompanying the scare itself. It's just the sight of someone being in the room with us who shouldn't be, and that's way scarier to me than your typical jump scare setup. I find that these more random and subtle scares do a great job at adding to and providing a release from the tension the game slowly builds up throughout its playtime. They terrify us, but also make us want to dig deeper and eventually find out what's even going on in the island in the first place. We get more clues every single day, building up towards something big until the final day where we find out what the real meaning of the game's title is. Now before I delve into the ending of this game and all the horrors that come with it, I'd like to ask that any of you who've taken interest in this game up to this point, stop watching this right now and go try the game yourself. The ending sequence of this game is a really cool one, and I'd really hate to spoil it for anyone who wants to enjoy the experience themselves. The game's only $8 on Steam, and you can finish it in about 2 hours or less, so if you've got the money to spare and I've made you interested in any way, please go check it out, and then come back here afterwards. Okay, so if you're still here, I'm assuming that you either don't care, or have bought and played the game, so let's talk spoilers. The ending sequence of Under the Lighthouse is easily the coolest part of the game in my opinion. Just when you're starting to get used to the environment of the island and the scares that come with it, the game suddenly thrusts you forward into a new nightmarish catacombs located underneath the lighthouse. This change of environment was a huge shock to me the first time I played the game, and the atmosphere of this new setting is far more terrifying than that of the island. While down here, you must solve a series of strange puzzles while being chased around by these Lovecraftian nightmares in a strange maze-like level, which is occasionally broken up by bizarre flashbacks to the island's past. In this part of the game, I feel like the visual and audio horror are brought to a whole new level. The designs of the environment as well as its ambience make the catacombs feel almost alive, like you've entered the belly of some kind of writhing monster. While we're down here, we occasionally see the skeletons and remains of people who were brought here like ourselves, and at one point we even see someone still alive in one of the body bags, lashing around violently trying to escape. This area just feels so vile, and I absolutely love it for that reason. The flashbacks of the past are also very interesting, giving us short glimpses into how a seemingly normal village slowly went mad because of whatever entity controls the island. We see the townsfolk start off relatively normal, slowly regressing until the end where they can only spout out strange Shakespearean quotes. It's an interesting way to break up the final segment that makes us genuinely feel really invested in what's really going on here, and our intrigue continues until we eventually reach the final boss. The final boss of this game is an interesting blend of both avoiding the main monster in a pitch black arena, and eventually retaliating against it if you got the shotgun in your first playthrough like I did. It's a really cool moment to end the game at, and it does a very good job at blending both the horror of not knowing where the monster is, and a genuinely fun challenge that doesn't feel unfair. What I also love here is that there are multiple endings which can be gotten depending on how you finish this fight. Under the Lighthouse has quite a few endings to it, but in my playthroughs I did for this video, I only really managed to get two of them. If you fall into the pit at the center of the arena, either because you have no weapon to fight with or because you fell by mistake, you get the ending where your character straight up dies and the cycle of sending another keeper to the lighthouse continues like you never existed. Killing the monster at the end gives us a better ending, where we manage to escape and get transported to the inside of the village's church, showing us what they were worshipping, some kind of strange demonic entity which dangles from the ceiling and turns the sky red. Yeah, I'm not too knowledgeable on the lore of this game yet, but this ending certainly got me interested. In the future, I'd very much like to get the others to learn what's actually going on in the game's story. 
I love both of these endings to the game a ton, because both wrap up the game in their own strange way which leaves it feeling bleak and filled with despair. In the ending where we die, the cycle just continues as it was, and you know that whoever comes after you won't be as lucky as you were. The ending where we get out alive is filled with such strange lore and imagery that it leaves you asking more questions than you went in with, and it genuinely pushes you to want to dig deeper and find more. No One Lives Under the Lighthouse is a horror game that I didn't expect much from going into it, but was very happily surprised by just how much I enjoyed it. The game uses its old graphics and small isolated map to create an experience that constantly builds up a terrifying tension that stuck with me for quite a while after finishing it. The story is wrapped in mystery, making you want to dig deeper and learn what's really going on, but you don't need to know what the story is in order to enjoy it as an overall experience. Experience. If watching this video made you interested in playing this game in any way, I highly recommend you go and try it out on Steam. There are still tons of things I purposely left out of this video because I want you to go and experience it for yourself and support the developers like they deserve. It's a short experience that is filled with passion for the genre, and I really love it for that reason. And if you enjoyed this video at all, then I greatly appreciate your support. I had a lot of fun making a video about another horror game I enjoyed other than the main FNAF content I do, and if this video ends up doing well, I'd love to make more like this in the future. Either way though, I'd like to thank you for watching, and I hope to see you back here for whatever my next project ends up being. Goodbye for now!